one. Um, hi everybody and welcome to today's Empowerment Show. It's really an honour for me today actually because I have got the lovely Maureen Tangai who is somebody I have admired from afar, um, her achievements, what she does and her passion for life. Um, I was introduced to Maureen through the lovely Maria Mackel, and but actually you, I had known about you anyway. And how That's I... Really nice. Yes. Hi, how, did you, how did you hear of us? That's a very key marketing question for any business entrepreneur. You see that? What I'm pointing to. Oh, nice. Thank you. So which, which what did you learn from the TED Talk that you liked or anything I, that really... I, I, I was very interested in... <clears throat> I've seen your two TED Talks, in fact. Um, the, one, the, one that I, the one that I uh, listened to fully was the one about how social media visuals affect our minds and mm -hmm. TED is something that's a big part of my life. I'm a mm -hmm. TEDx creator, license holder, uh, multiple time organizer and speaker myself, not at your level of course, but but I get there slowly. I don't think I have any TED level, I just, I've just done talks but I, have, I haven't got any levels of TEDs but it's really nice and I think it's Visual diet versus really the heart of our philosophy at the company as well. So it's just really nice that you've you related to it. It's something yeah. that's very dear to us. Yeah, it connected with me. And tell me what that talk like. Were you approached to do that talk, or did you apply to do it, or what was your what was your approach to that talk? How did it happen? Yes, yeah, so I was approached to do it um, on that sub subject as well, which was you know definitely a challenge because the subject of visual diet is the idea that visual shapes your life. So you are impacted by the visuals you consume daily, whether it's on the street, whether it's advertising, whether it's on digital. Um, the issue was very much when I was approached to do the talk on how was I going to prove this? What kind of studies could I lead? Because as you know, with the TED side, um, you can't just say it instinct wise, I believe that, right? So I think it, it, it's a really nice, um, story because since I was approached, I had to therefore demonstrate it and deepen the study side that we had led on that topic. Yeah. Um, and then it's it's about to become a book, as in it, the book is written, but it's about to be also released as a book, um, which has even deepened the study side of it. So, no, it's it's just I hope people are more and more self aware on if you live surrounded by visuals who make you better, who inspires you, will you know that really has an impact if you go past an advert that makes you feel shit or insecure, then that really has an impact as well. So it's just that awareness around your visual environment that we're trying to really bring out. Yeah, yeah. Well, you do an amazing job of it because, uh, and I know what you're like, but you're like, uh, you know, see, rewinding back, I was looking, you founded your own uh, art agency in 2015. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, what is... And I, I sort of got to know a bit about what it is. Like from the outset with an art agency, I was like, right, art, nice pictures, walls, galleries. But I didn't really know, like in my ignorance, I didn't know what a art agency is. So what is an art agency? Yeah, I mean, look, I think it's not an issue of ignorance. It's an issue that we were the first hired agency to be in the sector. So that's the reason why being novel obviously means people might not know what that means. Um, as you say, with a gallery, you have works on walls. It's almost like a very luxurious shop, and then you buy luxury items. For us, of course, you know our clients do buy art and then do put them on walls. But we also have partners who integrate the art on the streets in the cities, and that will be like governments or councils or real estate developers. So here it's less being a shop, it's really more being an office and being an agency that can help you place in the work of the artist in that context. It's the same when it comes to running creative collaborations. Um, we work with very known brands, we work with you know, other creatives in partnering our artists and doing that. And that's the same when it's not really coming to a shop, it's really kind of aligning um, the vision of your client with the one of your talent which is much more what a talent agency would do in music, film and sport, and just make sure that therefore the collaboration is a success. So it's um, for us, it felt very obvious that there was a need for this talent to have a talent agency. Um, and then that's how we became the first one. And, and yeah, we, we feel we're doing a lot more than galleries. We feel that this is a future of the, the market as well. Um, and our artists want to do all of it. They don't just want to be selling their works. Yeah, it's, uh, honestly, I'm blown away by your 
your vision for it, let's say, because not everybody has a, not everybody can see things like that, you know, and can see a need or a niche. And it's very much, Marine, do you know, you know, it's, it's very much like Think Network as well, you know, in terms of a vision. Like I, I looked around the world when I was looking for, you know, motivating, inspiring content and, and daily and, and environments where people could be the best versions of themselves and so on and so forth. And I see bits and pieces of it everywhere. Um, but I don't see it all together in one place. I don't see people creating bespoke uh, content and punching it out on a daily basis to a network of like-minded people and a platform that is committed to helping people be better, be the best versions of themselves within this particular genre. And, I, and that's why people say to me, oh, well, you know, who do, who, 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 who do you look up to or who do you benchmark? And, and, it's, and I say it humbly, but I look up to myself and, and, and I don't mean that arrogantly or any way at all. I'm sort of inspired by ourselves and what we're doing because I can't, I look around and I couldn't say, oh, that platform there, that's who we want to benchmark, be like, surpass, because um, cause I don't see it. And like, you know, so I feel, I feel I'm in that space, mind space that you're in. Does that make any sense at all? Yeah, no, I mean, look, I think anyone, I think when you want to be an entrepreneur, you want to add value ultimately. So, if um, if you feel you're adding value that is not existing, I think that's the best place to be as an entrepreneur because it means that you can really um, change the sector and add value to that sector as well. Yeah, yeah. But see, rewinding back then, take me from take me from I suppose um, you starting out with like where you're from and and what you started to do and where it led you to. How did you get to where you are now? If you know what I mean from that from 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 that. Uh, that internship with the BBC way back in the day? Um, so I've been, I'm born on a tiny island off the west coast of France, which is 9,000 people um, a year, so it's really small. We're six of the same age at school, which um, is also very limited in terms of options of people that you can know. Um, and I, in fact, we were due to be learning to read at eight instead of six. Uh, so my mum took on to teach me to read instead. Um, so I grew up in a very rural part um, of Europe, and and I say it's in a really beautiful way. I think it was a really stunning place. I think I wasn't in a really happy family home, so therefore I think creativity um, and anything that was visually inspiring really kind of helped me shaping who I was going to become. And I think it quickly became an escape. So anything that was um, a book, um, a visual that was inspiring, a, a play, anything I could have access to that felt like an escape I would be consuming it um, and really enjoying it so I think that the call to creativity was really from um, from an early age an early stage of my life as well and um, and then you know it kind of led me as you said to kind of study philosophy and literature in France and apply to the BBC when I was 19 um, I did send a poem to apply because I felt that motivation letters were a bit too structured um and you know and and therefore i i wanted i was I, I was lucky to kind of know what i wanted in a weird way because i didn't know it in terms of job titles but i knew it in terms of what it would look like and and yeah. what it would mean in in a sense as a job so i think what i'm doing is very much what me as a young girl would have hoped i could do mm -hmm. um all the job titles are pretty fictional because in a sense um, it doesn't really matter as long as, you know, I want to transform the world and make it inspiring with visuals. And I think I didn't know there were such things as job titles or companies doing that, but I did know that's where I felt I could add value. So I'm lucky that I was able to kind of identify that and and trust my gut instinct to make sure I could follow that, um, even if it wasn't like the most straightforward of paths to kind of get to. Um, but yeah, it's been, it's been a whirlwind since. And I, I was appointed a young director when I was 21 years old in London. And I think I've been lucky that some, for some reason, although I was very uh, demanding out of reality, reality also kind of backed me um, and gave me opportunities really young as well, um, without having any contacts in that world in the first place. Yeah, I, I love your story. And um, you said a couple of things there. One resonated with me. It was, you know, sort of almost trust and back in yourself, having that intuition to, to, or back in your intuition and having the courage to follow your passion, like you didn't have a, you didn't know what it looked, you, you knew what it looked like, but you, you didn't know it hadn't got a title 
and you went ahead and done it anyway and, fo and followed your sort of heart and followed your dream and followed your vision and and uh, and that's very admirable and they're very motivating for me um when i hear yeah. somebody when i hear somebody that's been on that journey and and, and i get motivation how did, you know, how did you know it was right for you i followed my my passion marine has always been to believe it or not and this sounds it's out some people look at me and raise an eyebrow when i say this but my passion in life has always been to help other people somehow some way right I always, and, and it always made me feel better when I did things for other people, right? And you would mm -hmm. think very early on, I would have realized, well, the more I do for other people, the better I'm going to feel. But I, mm -hmm. that didn't really land with me. But I did throughout my life, I was always doing charity work. I was always holding events. I was always doing something. But it was, it was, never, it was never in any industry. It could have been for anything. I was just one of these people who just liked doing this sort of stuff, right? I like putting it together. I like bringing it together. I like meeting people. I like project managing. I like all the stuff with that. And But I've always been inquisitively minded as well. And in my 30s, I did a degree and a master's in business and in management. And mm -hmm. I've always been passionate and believing in lifelong development and lifelong mm -hmm. learning. And um, I suppose my inquisitive mind took me into self-development, um, took me into the mechanics of how to be a better, how to, how to improve my own mindset, how to improve my own self-image, how to improve my own confidence, um, and how to improve how I seen the world and opportunities within it. And once I then had looked inwardly and had worked on myself, and my confidence now is at a high level, my mindset is bulletproof, my self-image is very strong, and I see the world full of abundance and full of opportunity and full of full of everything, particularly over the last year, would you believe? And once I had sorted that out, I then wanted to take people on that journey with me. I wanted to impact other people. I wanted to, to show them what had enlightened my life. And I had loads of opportunities to get, jump into other people's programs, like all the Bob Proctor stuff, all these different things. But I thought, no, I'm the change. I'm the, we are the change. We, we, we will be the platform. We will be the, we will be what I am look, what, what, what I desire to achieve. We are, we are it. And I am it. And, and I just had that belief in myself, Maureen. And then we just developed this platform. We, I strategically network with amazing people, including your good self. Now we're talking. I do that like times a hundred and opportunities come thick, fast. My affiliation with TEDx has been strategically amazing. The, um, and you want to know something? This is my purpose in life. This is what I was on this, putting this earth for. It was to make the world a better place, one event at a time, one TED talk at a time, one empowerment show with Marina at a time, one clubhouse room at a time, one webinar, one member, one Zoom, one everything. Everything I do must add value. If it doesn't add value, I'm not doing it. My life's, my time's too precious. My life's too precious. Your life's too precious. And if it doesn't add, and your time is too precious, if it doesn't add value, I'm out. And if it does, and that means me giving value as well. And, um, and I'm so passionate about it, honestly. Like it took me 42 years, 42 years to find my purpose in life, Marine. 42. I know I don't look 44, but I am. And uh, now I've found it. I am like a, I'm like a Formula One car with an unlimited fuel tank. Never short in motivation, ever. It's amazing. Also, it's an amazing feeling for you to be feeling that way. Yeah. And what about you? Like, 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 is this truly your calling in life, your purpose? Yeah, I mean, I didn't, you know, I think being French, I think call a purpose or anything feels a bit buzzy for, for, from a French perspective. Yeah, um, we can't really use those words very easily. But you know, I've been doing the same thing for 12 years and, and I can't see doing anything else in a sense it will expand. You know, the company is expanding. The team is much more senior. Um, I've also started investing in company in my space as well. Um, you know, for me, like driving positive impact to the sector and making sure the sector change, um, you know, to bring more interesting projects into it, to have more interesting artists into it is something that I see myself doing. I don't really mind the format in which I will be doing it. I think uh, we're lucky that um, theater is exploding and we're looking at the state's office for the fourth one at the minute. Um, but 
I think it's less on the core and the purpose at that point. It's just more something that I really think there's a there's a need for. Yeah. And then being 12 years in, you know, it, we have a voice to, in the sector. So if if we we can have an impact and make sure that things are changed if we believe this is the right thing to do. So there's also a sense of responsibility because I think the I'm very lucky to have the life that I have now. And I feel that if I can help it and, and kind of bring those responsibilities in the sector, then I'm delighted. So, you know, I, I, I do think I've ever changed since I'm five. I think this is where I'm really like, it's amazing that you've been so patient to find what you wanted to do. I think I've always been in a position where this is all I've ever done. Um, and there's, that's very much filled kind of, this is what I know how to do and what I want to do. Yeah. Um, so I wouldn't have it in years away. And I don't think I would know how to do it in any other way, if that makes sense. Yeah, perfect sense. It makes perfect sense. What motivates you in the daily, though? What motivates you? Where, do you, where does your, like, what motivates you? What motivates Marine to go, right, today we're doing X, Y, Z, we're, and tomorrow we're creating, you know, the day after we're doing, what, what, what's the, because there's, what, what's the driver and the motivation, like, behind what you actually do? I think it's, it, it depends on which stages of the company you build. I think at the start, obviously, it's a vision that motivates you because there's only you. So yeah. you have to get up and make sure that you execute the vision and, and make sure the vision that gets there. And um, in part two, I think it's, it, it's so much easier. But the second all the projects happen, you know, I get up and we have amazing people coming and say, we want to do this with you or this project is ongoing. Like just before that um, podcast, I was launching a public art project in central London just an hour ago. So I don't need help getting up in the morning. I think help getting up in the morning comes when you start a company and you see it to convince a lot of people and you get rejected a lot and and you're still on your own. But at that stage, frankly, like I work with people that I adore. I think they're incredibly smart. I think they really are super talented, whether it's my clients, whether it's a talent, whether it's a team. Um, team wise, you know, Lisa and Yan just exited their own company and then they joined us last year and uh, Blue was at Vogue as a director of partnerships before she joined us. So they all know a lot better than me what they're doing. So um, that's my senior team and it's a joy to learn from them on a daily basis. So I think it's not so much as motivating. I think every day brings a lot of surprises. I think also, you know, it comes a point for the business where it's, it's, you know, you see also things that you even had, hadn't dreamed of because you're so grateful that they're even still coming or things are even bigger than what you had dreamed of. So it's just really nice. You just have to make sure that you keep recruiting the right people. You keep expanding the right way. You keep the values at the core of what you're doing. But again, I think I'm more feeling very responsible now because I feel I'm very lucky to have something that's working and, and that's driving all of this. So I'm just making sure everyone is therefore looked after and that the, um, the community that we're building will continue to grow and, and continue to drive the company in the way it is. So it's, it's a very different, there's no need really, there's no need for hope or motivation. It's just, you just, it's much more a degree of responsibilities and making sure that everyone is, is okay um, because it's, it's just a joy as a wise. Yeah. Do you know what I get from listening to you, Maureen, uh, and when you're talking about your business and about your mindset and about where you are, there's a very much, uh, <clears throat> and, and, and there's not a lot of people have this here, actually, when I'm talking to them, is it like a, <clears throat> a definiteness of purp purpose about what you're doing, like a, like a clear, um, like a clear vision in your mind about what you're doing, why you're doing it, your values, your principles, um, what you're creating. Um, you may not know what tomorrow brings or what the next day or six months brings, but you're very at ease with your journey and what you're doing and what you're growing, you know, and I think that's, that's lovely. It's a, there's a nice sense of, um, there's a nice sense of calmness about your, you and your. I feel like if anyone followed our life, they would struggle to understand why we're very calm. But I feel it's much more stressful when you don't know, you know, you don't know if the company is going to survive or if your artists are going to have enough projects or if you can hire enough people. And I'm in a position where I'm not worried partially about any of that. I think so. It's um, it's just a very different stage in life. And and having gone through the early stages where it was much harder than that calmness does come with this appreciation but it also comes with just knowing and being knowledgeable that you know 
we can reach to the level of a CA in the next 10 years if we want to, and I'm very much concentrated on um, how we're going to do that. How are we going to go from like, you know, 10 people to 100 people in that company? And, and how can we make sure that, as you say, the vision, the values, everything kind of stays in? Um, but I can't wait to learn. I think all these things, I think at that stage now that life has become very nice, I think it's just really like a steep learning curve. And I just, I'm excited to learn about what that means to be building that kind of companies. And I'm sure we're going to be learning a lot along the way as well. Good. Uh, I'm going to throw a couple of things at you and then, and then, and then we'll, we'll I'll let you go and enjoy your beautiful life. Um, the, well, there was, there was something you said earlier about you don't hope anymore, but you're not hoping for things. And then you said there now, you know, and that's beautiful because they say, like, <clears throat> I've had a mindset uh, shift myself over the last, since I did my own TED talk in November, I used to, <clears throat> I used to talk about hoping and believing and thinking. And I was always, I, I used the phrase three feet from gold from the Napoleon Hill book, Think and Grow Rich. And I was always, and then, and then I actually met the author of Three Feet from Gold after my talk. He reached out to me and sent me the copy of his book, which was lovely. But here's the thing. I'm no longer three feet from gold. I no longer hope for X, Y, and Z. I'm actually in a place now in my mind where I know my faith is so strong that I am in my mind and in my heart and in the place I'm at. I just know that I am on the right trajectory. I know I feel and know what I'm doing is correct. I know the value that we're adding. I get that feedback from our members. And it's just a beautiful place to be in. And, and when your business is prospering and certain anxieties and nerves that you have sort of diminish and you're mm -hmm. then focused on growth um, and not from a place of scarcity, it's, it's a beautiful place to be, you know. But what I wanted to ask you was this two things. TED Talk number three. <laughs> Um, TED talk number three, I think, um, I think it needs to be on a topic that makes sense. Um, I, you know, like I just finished this book and I think writing this 180 pages was definitely a challenge while running the company. Mm. Um, I, I like, I think a book or a TED is something that stays. So it needs to be again, something that's really adding value to the sector. Yeah. Um, it may be, I think the topic is likely to be, which I believe is more and more something that's going to be asked out of us, is how do you disrupt a traditional sector? Um, the, the stories are horrible, frankly, from bullying to uh, competition levels being really unfair uh, from people who mostly usually privileged to the ones who are not, um, to tactics that are, you know, very, wouldn't be used in other sectors. I think, and and also very much a mindset that is stuck in tradition. Um, so I think disrupting a traditional sector and how do you go about it, and that can include the diamond sector as much as the art world, as much as the luxury sector. It can be anything that's very kind of um, traditional in its definition. I think could be it, and I, I see I see more and more the ask to kind of go about it. I think also that's an interesting place for me personally because it means. I will have to re-explore probably the, the times that were more difficult in building the business and and hopefully being understanding, you know, all of the things that went wrong or not, uh, or, or right. So I think that could be a topic. I think it's, as 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 you know yourself, I think it's just, it needs to be done properly. And um, yeah, the timing needs to feel right. But um, I'm, I'm never saying no about anything. It's just, I always believe that the timing needs to be right and everything needs to be correct around doing it. But, um, but why not? I think that's a topic that you have so little information on the internet about it. Yeah. And yet when you speak to any entrepreneur who would try to disrupt a traditional sector, they come up with the same challenges. Yeah. Um, and I think there's a lot of um, very little said about the challenges that occurs with this as well. Yeah, well, listen, let's keep that. Let's reconnect, maybe possibly about that conversation. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I've got a, a TEDx uh, Dairy London Dairy Studio license, which is only one of two in Europe. Um, that we create TED talks on an individual basis um, mm -hmm. around the world, external of events, mm -hmm. and, and and very reactive to what is relevant in mm -hmm. a current timing. So what we're talking about is quite relevant, <clears throat> and. Um, so let's reconnect about that at some point. I would love to do that with you. And um, it would be a real honor to facilitate that and share it. I need to research.
quite a yeah. bit more. <laughs> That's always the thing. Yeah. But I am, I cannot wait to go back to research. I think I spent my life doing things that it's like going back into the swimming pool and diving deeper because you know this is the only way you can learn anything about anything. So yeah. I think that I just, I get upset hearing about um, how how much harder it is um, into this kind of sector to do anything. And that that does bother me. Um, because I do think the sectors really need that disruption. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was looking at your two talks and you've got, what, there's about 30,000 views between the two of them. So um, going on the basis that everybody's got two eyes, that's, uh, that, 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 that's, that's a lot of people, um, that's a lot of eyeballs on your talk. So uh, um, it's, fantastic. it's been fantastic. Listen, it's been a real honour getting to know you, getting to talk to you. And, so it's uh, a good luck with your business. And like, it's really impressive that you found your call and you continue to try and find it because I'm always scared and advising people to continue or not because I felt like it was so obvious for me. So I think it's nice to hear that you were patient enough and then, and then you know, realized it. Yeah, listen, I appreciate that. And I appreciate comment, the comments and the odd message and that we, that we share. And, and um, honestly, I, I be, you know what I'm impressed with more than anything, Maureen, Maureen, more than any business or any big achievements or stuff. It's just people. It's yeah, people, um, and that's what I value most. Whether it's somebody I've met in a shop or somebody that I've met um, via our TEDx interests, where you were on my radar, and big, and the achievements, I'd be motivated by people's achievements, but I'd be inspired by people, and um, so, and you inspire me. So, um, and I'm very, very, I'm very grateful for our connection, and thank you so much, my friend. No, my pleasure. Well, we'll speak super soon. You take care. Have a lovely weekend. You too, my friend. Bye-bye now.